Hello everyone, Jonathan here with two revolvers. They are in fact the same design, but this one will come apart, so we'll do that a bit later. This is a Romanian design, um, slight sidetrack. Um, in, in 2020, uh, between quarantines, um, I actually went to Romania and had a fantastic time. Uh, before I went, I looked to see what Romanian firearms, sort of, um, uh, of Romanian origin, as it were, not just serve, or even even service, frankly, and we don't that we had, and we did not have much at all. And I missed these entirely because they were not catalogued as Romanian. Um, they were in the British drawers for reasons that will probably become apparent. But this is a, a uniquely Romanian design. It comes from a Captain Haralambia de Mancha, who was in 1881 was at. Um, the sort of national arms and ammunition testing facility in Bucharest. He was also from Bucharest. Uh, he'd received a sort of Medal of Honor equivalent, I believe, by that point in, in his career. He was an artillery officer. But he turned his hand to um, sort of overseeing arms and ammunition development. And as a result of that, came into contact with the Birmingham-based, UK-based, Kynock Company, and George Kynock in particular. And... He had he'd been working on this new design. It will go into some detail on in a moment. And he knew Kynock had the means to get his design made. So they, uh, Kynock took over the old Tranta factory and created the Kynock Gun Company, basically to make this new this new design of revolver. Now, interestingly, uh, Dimantia patents this revolver in, in the UK from a London address. So I wonder if he was actually living in the UK for the, for the, to develop this, or to at least to oversee the manufacture of the prototypes, which took place at the Kynock uh, gun factory uh, in Birmingham. Um, now, the, the, the story takes a, a, a twist, which will take us to the markings on this piece. George Kynock disappeared off to South Africa um, in 1888, which is kind of prime time for this actually being mass produced. Uh, and then died in 1891. So, some more of these are made then at the uh, Gatling Arms Company's factory, which weirdly enough used to be owned by Kynock. Um, but as far as I know, this is a this is not directly connected, and it's just another sort of contractor who is going to mass produce the Dimantia. And that is what we see on this this gun I've been uh, <laughs> holding the whole time without showing you anything. Let's show you something. So, the very thin rib on top of the barrel here. Hopefully that shows up. Fairly crudely on there is, uh, is stamped the address of the Gatling Arms Company and Demantia patent. And those are the only markings to speak of on these guns. And I gather there, well, they are more, there aren't that many out there. The ones that are out there are typically found with the Gatling markings rather than the Kynock markings. As you might have spotted as I turned that around there, this is in fact incomplete. We're missing this whole arrangement here. Uh, very happily though, we have this second piece, which I'll probably show you most features on actually. This is also incomplete, annoyingly. This is um, rough filed. You can actually see probably the filing marks on this big slab side here. Um, the grip I would Guess has been fabricated to complete the, the revolver later. It's a very close match for the shape of the real grip, but there's enough wood removed in certain places that it could not now be finished as a properly um, carved and, and, and polished and checkered grip. So I think that's probably been added uh, later on, but it, it is possible that that's just damage that's happened later on and this was on the gun when it was nearly finished at the factory. And the reason for this being unfinished and the other one at the Imperial War Museum that's also in the white and not finished uh, will become apparent by the end, I think. So it's missing its sights that are on the finished but incomplete example. So the blade, well, I don't know why I'm showing you that one for this. Um, the classic big round, rounded revolver front sight there and also the rear sight. And if you're wondering what rear sight, well, it's this groove on the hump on top of the revolver frame that's on this, on this one. 
Right, you can get a bit of a sight picture there. And not on this one. So this, this is almost certainly not a prototype of any kind because it's an exact match in every way that matters for this one. It's just not been finished off. And you know, fitting the sights is one of the last things you would do. Okay, so to the revolver itself. It is double action and it's double action only. So you'll see from the long trigger travel here that it's double action. You might have thought that this is some sort of funky hammer it is not the hammer, it is in fact the opening latch. So it's rather than being a tip up or a tip down or a gate loader or a swing out cylinder, this is in fact a pivot out to the left style system, which of course opens it up, uh, opens up access to the cylinder. Uh, now that isn't it, that just having access to the chambers of the cylinder is not Sufficient, of course, um, not for a modern revolver. So, uh, and I have to do that on this, this on this one. But we need a case slash unfired round extraction system, and on this, it is that. And you saw the amount of effort I had to go to there. Now, these are not new by any means. Uh, and Ian at Forgotten Weapons, the example he had access to in France, his wouldn't budge. Um, but that's how it works. I think if anyone was wondering who'd seen that one, and if you haven't seen it before. That's how it works. And it, all it does is leave the star extractor sticking out. So your empty cases would come out, you'd be able to retrieve any unfired rounds. And then to close it again, you just squeeze it back together and snap it shut. So it's functional, but as Ian pointed out, vastly overcomplicated, quite frankly. Um, even in terms of the operation, you know, it's not ideal to have to swing on the thing to, to get it open, to get it fully open basically. So we'll close that back up um, and show you the latch, how that engages. So thumb to, to pull that down. I think muscle memory would probably cause people to be to like, go to cock the thing. Well, that's not what this does. It's purely a latch for that mechanism. Pretty state, pretty um, robust. Lots of engagement there. It's not going to go anywhere. So it's quite, it should be quite a, a a solid design, not as solid as a solid frame, but more solid than uh, an open frame. So, so as far as that goes, it's okay. But I mean, you can see from just from the ergonomics of this thing, extremely top, well, extremely heavy, extremely top heavy, and even with the bent elbow <laughs> firing technique of the time, is is not not ideal. I wouldn't have said. Um, the only reason for that is to accommodate the mechanism inside. Right, I've loosened the screw, the main screw that you need to remove. Well, there are two, actually, but uh, the screw in the side. Now, that runs, that's the axis for the sprocket. Yes, that's right, there's a sprocket in here. So let's take that out the rest of the way. Set it aside. Now, that should allow us, we do have to open the gun as well. Here we go. <laughs> now, there's a striker under spring pressure here, so I have to be careful to not let that ping across the room. There it g tries to go. So that gives me a back plate that's shaped like the back of the, the revolver, which has these ribs on it, four ribs that run in the rails in the frame. And then this little, this returns, uh, well, striker spring, and that button lives in there. So we'll put that there. Uh, that's the, the spring tension gone, thankfully, so we can now pop out the... Now, this <laughs> this comes out via the top. There's a gap in the side there. I'll just show that to, to you there. This arm here, through which the center axis screw pin thing <laughs> runs, this whole thing, this whole leg here, goes inside down the side. It's as much for me to remember how to put it back together as to tell you anything. And then out, oh God. So let's show you the back. So you can see those cutouts. Everything runs on rails inside this massive, this massive chunky solid block of steel that's then milled out to create the cavity to fit all of the gubbins that you're about to see in. So there's a sliding plate on the top. 
So that, that looks like, well, huh, there are two. There's one riding, there's one on the top there. I don't know if you can see. The very top one stops short and is flush with the breech face here. The one below it actually pokes out and looks like it's helping to latch the gun shut, bearing in mind that this whole thing pivots into this position. But as it's only the front of this that's keeping the whole thing shut for shooting. This is actually pushed to the rear under spring pressure when you shut the gun. So that's not a, la a, a locking lug or of any kind. So let's remove the top plate. Well, see if I can remove them all at once. <laughs> Do this on our overhead camera. So we have that top plate. We have the second plate underneath it that aligns with the actual striker. So there we are. Managed to get that out in a one -er, nearly. <laughs> it's fallen over. So this is actually missing a spring. There should be a little spring on this, this rod. You can see that in Ian's disassembly. So bear that in mind. This isn't going to quite function as it should. And then the whole, those two sit on top of this. <laughs> That's the assembly. That's the striker that does all of the firing. So um, as Ian said in his video, a truly hammerless design. And then the critical part Or the, or the sort of innovation here, although it's innovation in the wrong direction, <laughs> is this double ratchet sprocket, sorry, double sprocket. And you say you have this thick center wheel, which is activated by the, tr by the uh, trigger. So I'll pop that out in a minute as well. And draws back, in very simple terms, with that spring you saw, draws back and releases, draws back and releases as this revolves. Pulls it back, lets it fly, pulls it back, lets it fly. We saw something similar with the bland patent pistol the other week, where we had a tumbler that pulls back a striker, lets it go, pulls it back, lets it go. Very similar uh, situation here. And then this, this secondary wheel sprocket on the side, and they are, they are um, square, square peg, square hole, uh, so that they fit together consistently. That is, that pokes through the breech face there. So if I, if I drop that back in, hopefully I can... Yes, there we go. So there, there's that there, that ought to be a normal rod style or, or um, uh, a, a pull or a, or a hand on a revolver is normally a fairly straight bit of kit. Well, here, only the tip appears straight because actually it's a revolving sprocket that pokes through. So it's not one, one pole that's pushing up on the ratchet cuts on the cylinder. That's how the cylinder is turned with these cuts. Other way, sorry. Each, each one turns it around just like any other revolver. It's not a rod pushing up, it's six of these. So they're, they're, they're accomplishing all the same stuff a normal revolver has to accomplish that would normally use a hammer and a straight pull operating off the trigger, absolutely sideways. I won't say backwards, but like a totally sideways approach, almost like, let's say the revolver had just been patented. You might make this to try and avoid the patent, but this is well after Sam Colt's patent has, has expired. So that's not why uh, Dumantia has done it. So the final disassembly stage. Um, so there is a, a lanyard system on here. It's currently got so a slight, slight detour. It has one of our old collection labels on it, ignore that. And attached to it is this very quaint Webley and Scott limited label. So this must have been in the collection of Webley and Scott or even sold by them as a curio, I guess. That's quite nice. We try and preserve that. And it just has written on it, uh, Kynock de Mancia, uh, caliber 38 revolver, incomplete. Um, MFG Manufacturing Gatling's Arm, Gatling Arms Company. So it's not telling us anything new, but it's nice to have nonetheless. So, sorry, as I say, a bit of a side, side story. The lanyard loop on this one is missing. Just unscrew, pull out that, that long rod, almost like the tang of a sword or something. We then pull out this also quite weird 
device here, which is knurled for the purpose, that comes out. This um, is, so that sits on the front strap, the rod runs up it, so it's all part of how, the, how it's retaining the grip. The grip then comes off and it's a solid piece of wood with a, a, an iron or steel end cap, butt cap, pommel cap, whatever you want to call it. Then int int probably the only not problematic aspect of this design is the trigger group, which just slides in and out on rails, almost like, uh, like a submachine gun or setup or something. And there is the, the trigger with this pivoting piece on the top. So this trigger group here, just to try and show you like this, turn it that way round. So the, the long teeth are the pull sticking out the front of the breech face. The short, thick sprocket teeth, gear teeth here, are actuated by that trigger there. So pulling the trigger back pushes the whole, th the whole wheel backwards and that draws back the striker and then it's allowed to fly forward. That's, that's in uh, very basic terms. This is crying out for a world of guns <laughs> development. <laughs> um, uh, there's also a, a stop, a long arm on the back here that once it's rotated into its next position like this, that arm on the back is there to stop the whole thing from, from turning so that you don't uh, get over travel. So the, the, thi the whole thing together, bearing in mind things aren't going to be quite in the right place <laughs> because I haven't got a, main, a means of fixing them together. Uh, ignoring these bits, <laughs> but with, this, with the uh, striker spring is going to look a bit like that inside the gun. So without, without trying to bottom out every detail of this, hopefully you get the gist. It is a, a sprocket driven, striker fired, double action only revolver. Now, we don't really know how many were made. There's allegedly a contract, well, there is a, a contract for a thousand um, from Romania. Um, I do, we don't know how many of those were actually completed. There are, I think the highest serial number observed is only something like 36. Uh, that may or may not be indicative of how many of the thousand were actually made. The fact that there are at least, there are at least two unfinished examples in existence is indicative of production shutting down before it was completed. And given the time frame here, only a couple of years, uh, or year and a half in the case of the um, Kynock examples, I think it is. Yeah, I'm not sure that this ever ever got finished. Um, allegedly, Romania and also France trialed this thing in some way. I mean, trial covers a multitude of sins from very serious, we really want to see if this is going to be the next revolver, to let's see how wacky this new device is. I suspect this was on that end of the spectrum, but I don't have the details of that. Uh, Romania, no, well, France, needless to say, did not adopt it. Um, Romania didn't either. They went with a version of the um, French Ordnance Revolver 1892 model as their model 1896. So it's much more conventional. Uh, Dimancia died sadly aged 44. Um, not that many, well, as I say, not that many made it out. Let's say at least 100 of these made it out. Uh, Schlund, the, his, his supervisor, the guy that was in charge of the manufacture of these things at the two fact, I think at both factories, he created a simplified version of this. And I think there were 541 of those that we know were made. So that kind of carried on the life of this thing for a couple of years. But that thing was just a break open design. So it was this design kind of adapted to a, break, a simple break open. So understandably that was um, a better prospect. But even that didn't really go anywhere. You know, there are so many probably cheaper, almost certainly better designs on the market, even than Schlund's, uh, Kynock Schlund uh, simplified form of this design. This really is a sort of uh, a side story in the development of the revolver. And of course, none of this stopped the Kynock company from going on to, to great success. It had been formed in 1862 to make percussion caps, um, was already very successful by the 1880s making ammunition, and was one of the major manufacturers of ammunition in the First World War. Um, and, and 
various sort of takeovers and, and things, but uh, the brand was still going well into the 20th century and is still known today. Uh, pu purchased by the um, ICI, or the company that the, the overarching company that uh, owned Imperial Chemical Industries, a famous uh, chemical paint uh, manufacturing company. So, uh, uh, you know, we might not know the name Dimantia, but we might well come across the name Kynock. In fact, we're almost certain to come across it again in future episodes. Thanks for watching, guys. Hope you enjoyed that episode. Um, as always, do check out our, our website, our social media outlets that we, that we have, our three uh, physical museums, of course, if you're in the UK at any point. Speaking of which, we do have a, a new exhibition that's just opening called Reloaded. Um, lots of well, mainly decorated firearms, some, some pretty fascinating stuff in there. A uh, gold-plated Kalashnikov, a uh, beautiful uh, Art Deco baby browning pistol, uh, all sorts of things for you to check out there. Please do come and see that. Uh, so all of that said, please do join us again here next time on What Is This Weapon?